Good evening. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another week of the Knowledge Report. This week is number 83. Uh, for those of you who are new, RK is a podium for us to share things we find interesting as a yet developer. Um, and uh, for today's topic, if you are interested in more resources, uh, you can use this link uh, to find more resources. Uh, this is in the YouTube channel description as well. Um, <clears throat> Okay, updates on our stickers. So we've been quietly giving out our limited edition speaker stickers uh, that looks like this. Uh, we're running low on this edition, but we're finalizing the design of our next edition thanks to our friend and designer Hui Jing who runs Singapore CSS and she's probably chilling out here under the Singapore CSS identity. Um, anyway, if you still want this year of the mouse, uh, special edition, uh, you will need to uh, propose to speak sometime soon. Ish. Shouting out to Shopee, who, are, who is paying our salary. Also, Engineer SG for the support on video recording and live streaming. Uh, we do have a COC. Um, <clears throat> please be courteous to each other. Right now is a good time for you to say hello uh, and introduce yourself in the live, live stream chat. Okay, um, so uh, for those of you who might be interested in giving a sharing, uh, here is the ways you can contact us. You can speak to Ken. If you don't like to speak to Ken, you can speak to myself. If you don't want to speak to neither of us, you can use this link to uh, pro uh, propose, uh, add your proposal to the issues and then we will contact you. Uh, right, so. Singapore CSS, Singapore CSS, it happened two days ago, which means, which means the next one will happen in a month. And check out their website. What does it say now? It says no speakers. Jialat is a Singaporean uh, slang. It means too bad. Send help. So how do you, how do you help? Uh, learn CSS now and share with us interesting things uh, <clears throat> in the September edition yeah looking forward to seeing you uh, also there are other events uh, locally right now uh, basically all events are happening online so check out engineer sp events for uh, anything else for today's sharing um we have a perfect schedule again with one lightning talk and one uh proper talk actually the other one is also proper uh anyway um, for today's brain challenge, let's begin actually with the second one on my list. Uh, I am a cat not. Uh, this one by Ven. So Ven appeared multiple times in our podium earlier as well uh, already. If you are new, she's one of us uh, with the coolest perspectives. Every single of her talks left an impression in me. So let me try to recall for you. She did a sharing on live objectives and drawing with CSS. And then she shared with us about React Hoots with Michael Jackson dance. And she's also one of the practitioner of learning in public. So today she's going to share with us something about CSS and cats. Uh, so uh, Ben, are you here? Uh, it's all yours. Let me stop here. Then you can start sharing your screen. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you now. All right, cool. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. It's been a while. It's actually my first sharing for this year. Uh, my bad. So I'm Van. Um, I like drawing and climbing. I really like music and coffee as well. And I also like cats. Um, however, what I'm going to share with you about today is none of the above. Um, it's going to be something that I am really passionate about, and that is learning languages, human languages. So um, right now, on a daily basis, I am using three languages, of course, excluding JavaScript. Um, so the first thing uh, is none other than my mother tongue, Vietnamese. Um, the second one is English. So I was actually thinking which country to represent English, because usually I think we use either US or UK, but honestly, I don't care as long as you speak English. Everyone understands you are speaking English. 
and actually even Singlish count as well, right? And um, since it's going to be Singapore's birthday soon, so okay, fine, I'll put Singapore as the representative for English. And the third language that I'm using every day now is uh, Japanese. It's something that I have started recently learning. So um, I just felt like there is uh, a few things that are interesting about these three languages as a combination. So I'm, I'm here to talk to you about it today and it's something that is not technical at all. Um, in order to do that, I will touch on very simple grammar points for Vietnamese and Japanese. Um, because we all speak English, so there's no need for me to elaborate further on English grammar. Um, so let's start with Japanese grammar first. Um, I think we have a few members here who are actually learning Japanese as well. So um, even if we are beginners in Japanese grammar, you will realize that there is something very curious about the language, um, which is the verb always um, is placed at the end of the sentence or the phrase. So this is what is called SOV structure, which stands for subject, object, verb, as opposed to English, which has subject, then verb, and object. As to um, how um, as to how people can tell that uh, which is subject, which is the object, they have something called a particle, but uh, I'm not going to cover that today. So as see, uh, as we see in the um, in the Wikipedia example, if in English we say Sam ate oranges. In Japanese, it becomes Sam oranges ate. So again, how do you know whether it's Sam that is eating the like oranges or the oranges eating Sam? They have something called a particle, but that way I will leave to you to you to read by yourself. So we have another example here. Let's say you want to say I am a cat. Then in Japanese, the verb to be because verbs always have to be at the end of the sentence, so they will put the verb to be after the cat. Similarly, if you want to say, I am not a cat, then the negative verb is also placed at the end, after the cat. Now, because of this um, property that places verb at the end of the sentences, we have instances where the corresponding words in English are placed in reverse order compared to their counterparts in Japanese. So I'm trying to compare the two languages by color coding and then drawing the lines in between. So um, to visualize if the lines cross each other, that means that the, the words are actually placed in reverse order. If they are not crossing each other or looking like they are parallel, that means in that case, the words are in the correct order, the same order. Yeah. So here we have the situation where um, the second phrase I block it in orange because they are basically in the same order. But in the first part of the sentence, it's almost in complete reverse order. The only part that is um, almost, you can say is parallel, is this part, the noun, long song, nagai kyoku. And here comes Japan, Vietnamese. Right, so Vietnamese also has its own share of curious properties. But to me, the first thing that I noticed when I start learning English as a second language is that um, opposite to English, in Vietnamese, they put the modifier or the, the adjective after the noun. So let's say you want to say red apple. In Vietnamese, they will mention the apple first and then the color red. Or you can go further if you want to say red color pen. In Vietnamese, they put the pen first, then the word color, and then the word red. So um, in technical terms, Vietnamese is considered an analytic language. Um, what I personally take from it is that they don't really see, I think Vietnamese doesn't really see the adjective as a modifying part of the noun. They just see the, the adjective and the noun. And depending on the context, you can see that the adjective is referring to the noun. So it's a different, you can even say it's a different philosophy based on different languages. Now let's go back to the previous example we have between Japanese and English. So we, we have seen that the part that English and Japanese actually agree. The only part that English and Japanese here agree on is the part that is circled in red. 
and Vietnamese go and go opposite to that. So that's what I um, why I I say I find this combination is very interesting because you have something finally you have something that is in common between the first two and then the third one come and disagree on the part. Um, I'm not sure how um, someone who is um, an English speaker will feel if they try to learn Vietnamese and Japanese at the same time, but it might pose some confusion during the process. Um, so that is um, the part where I want to focus on for Vietnamese. If, if you want to go further into the grammar of Vietnamese, it's going to be a bit hard to compare. So from here on, I'm just going to compare mainly Japanese and English. So um, previously, we, we, we can see that the first phrase, the, uh, the first part of the sentence um, is almost in reverse, but the second part, the part that is highlighted in orange is actually um, the same in the same flow. But can we have some another example whereby um, the second part, the other parts of the sentences will also go in reverse of each other. So we have this um, example here, whereby you can you can roughly divide the sentence into two parts, and it just um, although the two parts are in the same order um, in English and Japanese, within the, the two parts, each of them are almost in reverse, completely reverse order. So as beginners of our languages, often we have the habit of um, trying to divide the sentence into parts first. Then for each part, try to translate to a language that we are familiar with, and you put back together um, to form the complete sentence. Does it sound familiar? Does it feel like something that we all in computer science have to learn? You know, break things up, try to solve, and then put back together. Yeah, this is what I'm I am referring to. But okay, I'm just I'm just exaggerating. Okay, it's not that bad. If it's if it has so many layers, I think even the Japanese uh, speakers, um, the Japanese people themselves might get confused. So, um, even in this kind of example, we still have lines that are parallel, right? So you can see the two parts here. Um, the lines are still cro not crossing each other. So, is there? Any instance that the two languages, the, the, same, the same sentence might have, um, when we translate from Japanese to English, for example, and vice versa, the two sequence actually are in complete reverse. Of course, there is. Um, so, this is a line um, from a song by One OK Rock. Um, so, the, the original text is the Japanese text, Furitomarai Ame Nado Nai, which means there's no rain that doesn't stop. Um, the, the song basically tries to say that there's no struggle that doesn't end. So uh, we, need, we, we should try to hold on until there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So that's the rough meaning of it. But if you, if you translate the Japanese text into English word by word, it is something like um, falling stop, not rain is none. Sound familiar again? I'm not sure why um, is it that we as programmers really like to have Star Wars quotes, but it just happened this one is really suitable for this. Okay, so I guess if someone asks you how to talk at Yoda, you can say, learn Japanese. Um, this talk is not sponsored by the Japanese Tourism Promotion Board. Thank you. Um, so um, this is a nice song, by the way. If you want, you can listen to it. Um, let's just have one last example. That is a little more, even more extreme. So this is um, a verse from a song called Yukaruta, um, roughly translated to Song of Long Autumn Night. Kami wa sai koro wo hulanai. God does not grow the dice. Um, it's also a very nice song, so if you want, you can listen to, but I think you have to check with the Japanese text because there's no official English translation for the song. So um, the one I want to focus on here is the last two lines, the last sentence. Because after trying a few times to translate so that it keeps um, the context as much as possible, I realize in a complete reverse order again. And the thing is, um, if there is no 
if there's no anata at the end of the last sentence, anata is a formal way of saying you. Right? So if there is no anata at the end of the sentence, actually we can try to translate according to the order of uh, the original text, which means we can, we can mention the flower scent getting weaker, and then at the end of the autumn, you left. But because there is the anata, and there's also a context here, um, there is a you that is already mentioned in the previous sentence in the same verse. That's why um, after such a long string, right, you see the word anata, then naturally you think, oh, okay, so the you must be in the first. And then because the, the you is actually being compared to the sense of the osmanthus, um, it becomes, uh, everything becomes reverse. You need to, we will be um, mentioning the you first, and then when autumn end, and then the sense of the osmanthus, and it becomes a complete reverse. So, this is quite a common poetic writing um, in Japanese songs. You know, um, after you have heard the whole sentence, really, you're like, oh, so that's what he's been singing for the last 10 seconds. Now I get it. So um, after learning a new language for a while, I think our the way we process information starts to adapt to the language. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, if you want, you can check out the song. So that is um, the end of my talk today. Thank you for listening. Wow, that's that's really cool. That's really cool. Uh, it's a really cool way to think about the order of the language and then together with a sorting algorithm. Well, uh, thanks for the sharing, uh, for the time uh, in consideration. We won't be doing Q&A for this one. But uh, I see people chatting about the songs in the channel already. So uh, please, please go ahead and, and, and enjoy the rest of the, the, the sharing and chatting with people who share the same interest in the songs. Uh, all right, thanks again. Let's move on with our uh, topic today. So uh, I think I won't share my screen anymore, but for our second sharing, we'll have another, uh, <clears throat> another cool speaker. So Chris, Chris recently joined our team. He shares a same first name with our CEO. So every time I send him a meeting invitation, I risk misdirecting the invitation to our CEO. Um, so far that hasn't happened yet, but you know, who knows. Anyway, it turns out before becoming a front-end engineer, Chris was learning to become an aerospace engineer. Uh, I actually don't know what caused that pass to have gone south, but good that he has, he's with us now. And uh, he seems to have something really cool to share with us today. So, Chris, please. You can start sharing your sheet. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, hello, everyone. So, um, thanks, Darwin, for the introduction. So, um, yeah, I guess previously I was studying aerospace engineering, but um, I think there are certain circumstances right now that. Uh, isn't ideal for an aerospace engineer. So but anyway, I'll start with the sharing. Uh, so today I would like to share about um, web JR libraries and um, quaternions. So uh, before I go into this too, actually, uh, like maybe some backstory about it is uh, when I was in school, uh, I actually um, managed to go to Shanghai once to do an internship there. And then the internship over there was actually about uh, building a um, a web application um, for for that uses WebGL. So what they needed was because they needed uh, a way to sort of uh, visualize and manage a uh, huge data set. So in China, actually, uh, things like uh, solar parks. So places like this has a lot of um, solar panels, and then uh, it's a bit hard for people to physically observe, like manage them. So if you can visualize them in place like uh, like a digital wall, so uh, it's easier in a sense. So uh, in, over there, that was how I got uh, exposed to uh, WebGL. And then uh, we were building some projects like uh, this you can see here. So uh, let me introduce some libraries. So um, I think there are two main big WebGL libraries. The first one is uh, 3GS. So this one actually has, um, like it provides more 
variety in terms of uh, aesthetics. So it usually like it looks it looks the best uh, um, if you observe like what's available in the market. And then the next one, uh, which is one that I dealt more with, was uh, CGMJS. So what this provided was uh, it actually provided a lot of uh, geospatial related uh, functionalities. So um, you can think of it like a way to build your very own Google map. Yeah, and then uh, but and then there's also one other key point was that it actually allowed a lot of uh, a lot of different types of formats of um, 3D models to be loaded into. So in this situation, it was uh, especially convenient for uh, the company I was interning at uh, in Shanghai. So um, prior to this, I just set up some simple demo. So because um, I actually went back to like so recently, I went back to try it out again to see like you know like, like uh, remember like how like the things that I did back then, and then I went to build up a simple demo. So to start off, this is this is how it will work. So I'll start with the very start, which is um, after you imported all the libraries and then you set up your usual uh, React app. So uh, the very best start of it is you have to you have to attach the season viewer. So this is this is where the basic uh, entity that represents the season jets uh, that you Chris, will use throughout the whole project. Sorry, Chris, can you uh, enlarge your video? Uh, enlarge your oh, code screen. Okay. So yeah, so just look at this one. So over here, I'm basically uh, creating a viewer. So um, oh wait, so for viewer, right, it's basically I'm just importing them all from the season library here. So once I've imported that. Uh, I just attach it to uh, a system canvas, which is actually uh, div with an ID system canvas. So once that is done, um, I set it as, as in I use hooks to set it because I just want to check it uh, at a later time. Yep, so sorry, can I zoom once more? Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so the very first step is just attaching the season JS uh, view itself to a div, and then this is what you'll get. So um, this helps you to jumpstart many of your um, many of your projects. Like you can straight away start working on uh, um, any project that requires some geospatial like uh, earth. So the next step was um, once you're inside, you gotta try to move around like in terms of how you view different things, right? So uh, season provides this thing called a camera. So just look at here. So what this camera does is um, it basically uh, provides a method that allows you to fly to a certain destination. And this destination is usually a XYZ destination. So, um, but then because uh, over here we are looking at Earth, uh, CZM also provide a lot of methods for you to convert like very Earth-related Earth uh, ge uh, Earth geo, information like longitude, latitude, and altitude to XYZ so that you can uh, accurately fly or, or move your camera or your viewport to the same location. So this was the second one that I set up. So basically uh, like a basic control for my cameras. So uh, yeah. So what happened here was I basically flew to Singapore in a sense. So this is like Singapore itself on earth. Um, in terms of parameters, uh, my location here is actually uh, basically the basically the longitude latitude of Singapore followed by the altitude, which is how high I want to view Singapore from. So yeah, so this is the very first uh, method that I wanted to introduce. So this is basically just controlling the camera of uh, provided by CISM, allows you to see different part of it. So the next one I wanted to introduce was um, so. This means so once you have to control where you want to see on the uh, the WebGL space, you want to try to input like different objects, right? Because uh, it's basically like a world you want to create on your own. So you can do things like draw a line. You can do things like draw a square. You can do things like um, image insert your own images, uh, and you can draw things like circles as well. These are the more basic shapes. So um, actually, all these are exposed as APIs uh, on the CGM documentation. So but I'll do a quick run through in terms of some of the parameters they will need. So usually, um, for these shapes, right, for these basic shapes, uh, usually just set some positions. Like for a line, you probably need to start at an endpoint, and then 
in a, a width and then the color. This the colors are usually, uh, usually optional. What you, what you usually need is basically just a certain position. So once again, the position is uh, X, Y, Z. In this case, you have two positions, the start and the end. So you have an array of uh, X, Y, Z positions. Right, and then same thing for the square. Uh, this, uh, in this case, we use a polygon, so it can actually be more than uh, one corners. So uh, depending on how many uh, corners you put inside, how many how many XYZ sets you put inside, and how many sides the polygon will have. And then for the build board, uh, it's basically just inserting the image uh, over here, and then you set a position. The position will be the center of the build board. And then uh, the ellipse is uh, the ellipse is basically the most general form of some of uh, of that, that includes both circles and ovals, right? So over here, um, you just set the semi-minor axis, semi-major axis, which refers to the thinnest part of the uh, oval and then the thickest part of the oval. And then if these two are the same, you get a circle. So, and then rotation for a certain orientation of, um, of, the, of the circle. So this will look something like this. <clears throat> So this is the image that I that I that I imported, and then this is the over that I drew, and then this is the line that I drew, and this is the square that I, the polygon that I drew. So yeah, so these are the this, so so these were like this were like the like the hello world of uh, CGMJS basically. So afterwards, um, I started to try something else. So because CGM provides you to uh, because it's a three D world, right? You don't want everything to be in two D. So. Uh, the next, the next step that I looked into was trying to was trying to start um, placing in three uh, D models. So uh, let's let's call this function insert object. So uh, over this case, in this case, I downloaded a model. Uh, it's basically COVID nineteen cell model, the virus model. I downloaded it and then I tried to inject it into this three D model, three D world. So uh, what do you need for it? So you basically need to set a location uh, once again in uh, X, Y, Z. So this will be the exact location where the virus will be placed on, on Earth. And then you have the model matrix. So when I first started this, when I first did this and I saw model matrix, I didn't really pay much attention to it. I just, um, I didn't know like exactly what it was. And then um, I just Google around like, how can I just quickly get past this, uh, this, 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 this value that's required. So um, they just said like, use this transform, is not up the fixed frame and just set in the position of the model matrix. So um, I'll get into more detail with this later, but for now, I just did a quick run through because I wanted to see like how the model would look like. Then afterwards, uh, I created a model. This is another system uh, method. So basically you just, what, 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 you, what, you need, what, what you need require is basically the URL, obviously where the, where, the, where the model was located. So I downloaded the model, I copied it into this project and then I set it to the URL, then I set um, the model matrix, and then I set a scale. The scale is in terms of how magnified you want the model to be. And then <clears throat> lastly, I injected, uh, so basically this is adding the model officially into the CZM viewer itself. So then this part is basically just shifting the camera to look at the model. So when you do that, oh, oh yeah, so uh, like the position, the position, right? Once again, I put Singapore again. And then afterwards, you just load the model. And then, okay. Mm, okay, wait, let me restart this again. But get the model. Oh, wait, why the model is not coming? Maybe this is weird. Okay, the model is not loaded. Okay, let me check. Okay, let me see. 
Jesus. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, and okay, sorry about that just now. Uh, I think I configured something and then I didn't turn it back. So, but anyway, then this is this is the model that was injected. So now you can see that um, we have a COVID-19 virus right in the middle of Singapore. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so that's one of the uh, things that you can do with uh, Library. So you can create this world and then you can load your own models inside. And then this looks fine, like loading a model inside. So afterwards, I, I, I wanted to try something else. I wanted to try like creating your own vehicle inside. Um, like what if you could create a, uh, for example, like a truck, right? So, <clears throat> so for this part, uh, what I did was I, uh, like, um, okay. So in this part, it's a bit more. Like there's a bit more work here. Like um, I actually use this thing called the CZML. So this is a CZM related um, data format. Uh, but basically what it did was it, it carries a few information. First one is the model itself, followed by, um, <clears throat> followed by uh, a certain time duration and a certain like start and end point. But that is, um, in, 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 that, in, in this case, that is not uh, very relevant here because uh, CZML is actually, you can just read up on documents and you can probably get it out like very quickly. But the idea was I, I wanted to load a van that can move on its own. So uh, with the model loading, everything else kept the same. Um, I, I got the model from uh, online and then I put it in again. And then uh, I tried to load it. Okay, but by this time I found that the model was, um, was pointing downwards. Uh, and then uh, it, the previous case didn't matter because the COVID nineteen looks the same from all angle, right? But but for three D models or three D objects, like um, they actually they, they actually have a certain um, orientation that you have to take along. So in this case, you see that the the vehicle is pointing down. So at first, I didn't know how to fix this. I didn't know what was exactly wrong. So um, I went to dig around a bit, and then like I realized that it was the issue of um, the model matrix. All right. So from um, from the model as in so. Uh, when I try to look uh, deeper into it, I saw that um, every entity actually has something called the orientation. And then when I tried to print out, like, what was this orientation? Uh, this should be in so when I try to print out what this orientation is, uh, yeah, I get it some called the Croptonians. So now, um, now that's one other thing that I totally did not know, which is quaternion. So at that point, I knew that um, there's two things that I wanted to look into. So one was how the modern how the modern matrix was being handled. The second one was the quaternion. If I and I had to know this too, if, if I want to fix um, <clears throat> this orientation issue, which is getting the truck to look right or basically just standing properly on this uh, piece of land here. So, which brings us back to the next part, which is um, trying to understand what, what matrices and um, quaternions are basically in order to uh, actually understand the problem and then fix the orientation issue. So, uh, we, if you start from the very end, we know that in a 1D space, uh, you basically represent a single dot on a line, and that is what you call a position, right? And then there's no there's no orientation here because uh, they look the same, no, no matter what. And then in a 2D world, wherever X and Y exist, you can represent a position and this time something more, which is the orientation. So if you look at this example here, which is the oval, you can see that um, at different positions, it actually has a different orientation, which, is, which can be easily represented by an angle rotated around a, uh, an, an axis that is normal to the over itself, right? So now we have position and orientation. And then in a 3D world, it's the same thing from the 2D world, except uh, now orientation becomes even more complicated because um, like you're thinking of three different kinds of rotations, uh, three different kinds of orientation. So we can see that um, like this, 
like this person, like this, this, this lady in a, in, a, in, in the XYZ axis can basically face many, many different uh, directions at once, right? So, um, to how is into how to, 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 to do this orientation, uh, I had to look into like from the very, very start of it. So the, the very, the very, the very, the very first or the most simple way to represent orientation or do an orientation is using what we call the Euler angles. So Euler angles is basically the, uh, probably the one of the earliest way or the most straightforward ways to basically carry orientation. So what it is, is, is actually basically three angles to represent the orientation of a rigid body. So um, on the left side, this equation here is basically the math part of it. So uh, the idea is that you basically only need three angles to fully describe the orientation on the body. So if you look at this G here, you can see that uh, there, are, there are three orientation and they're carried out one by one. So what happens here is uh, they first, they first rotate around the Z axis. Afterwards, you rotate around the X axis and then it rotates around the Z axis again. So uh, this is an example of the uh, of, of, of orientation being done, uh, the, U, the, the Euler angle, angle method. So uh, the matrices here, D, C, and B, they're actually um, orientation for different axes. So one matrix represents orientation using one, uh, one axis. So for example, D will correspond to uh, Z, C will correspond to Y, B will correspond to X, etc. But the idea of Euler angles is basically you just need to represent, you, you, just, you just need three angles, which is um, this phi, I believe it's phi and uh, theta and psi um, to represent, uh, and then uh, you can represent a certain orientation in space. So yeah, so this is an GIF to show a certain orientation. So, okay, yeah, this is a bit slower. Yeah, so followed by a second orientation and followed by a third rotation. So with three and with three with three rotation, you can always accurately describe an orientation of a body in space. So you have a, so over here you can see the before and the after. All right. And then um, once you have a before after, so this A matrix, when I'm when I multiply uh, D, C, and D together, will give me this uh, this 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 one huge uh, no this single matrix by three matrix, which we call the rotation matrix, and actually this actually represents uh, uh, even more uh, like 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 there's a more intuitive way to see this rotation matrix. It actually simply represents um, like the final the the final unit vector of the new axis. Right, so you can imagine that initially Z is um, 0, 0, 001, X is 100, 0, 0, and Y will be 0, 010. 0, right. So after rotation, Z will be something different. Um, okay, honestly, I can't tell, but then like it will just be three different vectors. And then if you if you put them side by side like this, they will be exactly the same as if you had applied uh, Euler angle to it. So this is uh so over here what what we call this is we call this a rotation matrix, which is uh which is calculated from Euler angles or simply um, representing three column vectors side by side like this. So now we know now now we have a rough idea of what matrix is. Uh, it feels like we matrix could solve everything. So why do we actually need um quaternions, right? So uh, there's actually some weakness to this um, this this way of um, get of, of achieving orientation. So there's a there's a situation called a gimbal lock uh, when you carry out um, matrix operations in particular Euler angles, uh, which is basically if you were to recall Euler angles is basically applying three angles rotation like this, right? So this, so so you can imagine that we have four frames here, and to 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 reach to 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 reach each subsequent frame, you simply apply a certain Euler orientation in sequence, right? One two three, one two three, one two three. So you can see that uh, as you um, you can see that okay. So this example is actually an aircraft, and then the gimbal will represent this gimbal. This gimbal is this three axis thing, right? So this this so these three circles, which basically represents the axis that the plane can rotate around. We call this the gimbal. 
So you can you, you, you can imagine that this gimbal will represent the plane's orientation at any given time. So as you apply uh, Euler's or, uh, like Euler angle rotation to it, you slowly change the gimbal to, 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 to achieve different orientation of the plane. And then you can see that at, so at some points, in particular in this case, when one of the axes actually rotated 90 degrees. So in this case, particularly like the, the plane has a pitch, which means the nose goes up, the nose of the plane, plane goes up by 90 degrees. Uh, two of the axes of two of the rotation axes actually coincides perfectly. So in this situation, if you were to apply subsequent all angles to it, right, you will get, um, you will only get rotation around two axes. Like, this means that the, 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 the plane in this situation is unable, is only able to have uh, two, two kinds of rotation uh, around this axis, around this, uh, along this circle, and along this circle. So in this situation is, uh, what happened is we call it like gimbal lock, which means that um, the plane has basically lost the ability to rotate around, um, to rotate around three different axes. In this case, it can only rotate around two axes. So uh, this is this is actually quite um, this is uh, this can be very disastrous in um, in many situations. Both uh, uh, I can share some examples in like in in like um, aerospace industry. So uh, mathematically, when this happens, um, some of the some of the values will achieve uh, infinite solutions. So you won't be able to resolve like. Uh, like some of the calculations, and, and then like this, this will this will actually affect a lot of um, a lot of uh, flight situations. Uh, like um, when, um, in terms of like calculating, um, like for example, certain responses, things like that. Um, but also, uh, also when 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 a plane lost the ability to fly in certain angles, it actually loses a lot loses loses a lot of um, lo loses a lot of um, control over itself, and uh, and that can be very uh, so so basically like you, you, so basically it loses one as losing one degree of freedom is equivalent to losing a lot of control over the plane for a pilot yeah so this is this is gimbal log basically you lose uh the, the ability to rotate around three axes three axes now you can rotate around two so we call it losing one degree of freedom so <clears throat> so in this situation um we have this thing called the quaternions so quaternions didn't Come out just to solve uh, gimbal lock. Uh, it was this. It, it came out for um, it came out for a different reason, but it happens to be able to solve um, gimbal lock. Uh, in, because it because it basically is able to represent our orientation as well, but then um, not the same way as matrices uh, do it. So uh, quaternions was basically found by this guy called uh, Sir William Hammer, uh, Sir William, and then. He just thought of it one day when he was crossing this bridge in Durham, and then he and then this bridge from then on has his uh, discovery of quaternions carved into it. So, <clears throat> uh, what quaternions actually operates around a three D uh, complex space. Uh, so the exact math itself is quite complicated, so it won't be covered here. And also because I don't really fully understand the full math behind it, uh, but then. Uh, the main the main idea is that quaternions is made up of a scalar and a vector. So a you can see this uh, this this equation uh, for like a usual quaternion. So a is a scalar part, b c d is the vector part. So uh, just by doing just 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 this can represent um, a certain a certain orientation, right? So how does it represent is um, you can see that um, Euler actually uses tree rotation to represent. An or, an or a rotation and therefore an orientation. Um, quaternions does it uh, in a single rotation because actually if you think about it, if you rotate three times, you, it's possible to compress compress that three single the true rotation to a single rotation. So what happens is you uh, not you like quaternions basically needs simply need to define a single uh, axis of rotation followed by uh, how much to rotate around that angle. And you can achieve a orientation. Uh, so that is the idea of quaternions. So um, yeah, so BC, BCD represent the axis of rotation, and then A represent the angle of rotation. So uh, why quaternions so far? Who is because quaternions basically compresses uh, 
uh, like three, three, three rotation in terms of how Euler does it. Euler does three rotation. Cotton is able to compress that into a single one rotation and achieve the same thing as well. So um, let's, I'll, I'll share this video here, which is basically Cotton's visualize. It's a, it's a very interesting way to visualize Cotton that I found online. Uh, how they do it is basically, uh, apparently uh, it's, it, it operates on like a hype, something called a hypersphere. And then, uh, yeah, so I, I was watching halfway and I, I, I got lost quite a few times. So I'm still trying to rewatch it. Uh, but then that aside, everything else between continents and uh, matrices are pretty similar in terms of how they are operated mathematically. Like uh, you just multiply them to get the same uh, resultant orientation, etc. So now we have the general idea of what quaternion is. Uh, we'll do a simple comparison. So to compare between quaternions and matrices, right, they're actually more advantageous around it. So quaternions are actually faster in calculations. In a sense, if you were to multiply a quaternion by a quaternion, you actually use less operations as compared when you multiply a three by three uh, matrix with a three by three matrix. And then Quaternion is much more compact. It only requires four variables to store it. And then one matrices will require nine variables, as you remember from, um, from this rotation matrix. Right? A, a rotation matrix needs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Whereas for a quaternion, you only need one, two, three, and four. So that was a huge advantage that quaternion has. And quaternion will not come into gimbal lock, whereas matrices will come to gimbal lock. But the hard thing about quaternions was that it is um, it is actually very hard to visualize. So it's um, it's easy right it's easy to do it when you write it down as uh, math equations. But when you want to visualize it, it's actually uh, pretty hard. So now I had a better understanding of what quaternion and matrices is. It was easier to go back to solve it, right? So now back to this thing. Like we saw this chart that was looking down. So I know that this chart basically only needed to rotate around its x-axis, which is this, oh, uh, sorry. Okay, it, this, so if the z-axis is the one sticking out, then the one that is in front will be x and the one that will be on the side will be y. So I, so you either be x or y-axis. And I know that you only needs to rotate around the x or y-axis by, uh, by, by 90 degrees, right? So uh, all, I, all I need to do is just fix this, uh, this, this orientation. So. I'll go back to the code here. Uh, yeah, so I've 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 taken out the the code that actually affects the orientation of the entity. So over here, uh, I wrote this out. So QI basically represents the quaternion that I want to apply to the orientation of the entity, right? And then I wrote down here, which is um, I need a rotation, uh, my rotation axis uh, will be unit will be y, which is unit, which is unit y, which is this, which will usually be this, this vector coming up from here. So I only rotate it here and then by a number of uh, 90 degrees, which in this case will be pi over two, right? So let's put this as, uh, okay, so anyway, okay, so this is a form of, but anyway, I'll just put this as one, um, 3.14 So I just rotate it by right here it, and I sh and I get my um, and I simply need to multiply it to my entities orientation because um, I want to change this orientation to this new orientation. So and then afterwards I set it to my entities orientation. Uh, I set the value to the new coordinates, which is this one. Uh, new new Q and then um, so like uh, okay this the new coordinate at the back this is just the way season JS APIs work so uh, it's basically just creating a new object um, normalize so normalization is just making sure that my coordinate is a unique coordinate so that uh, there's no scaling involved so yeah so if I were to set this and this should this should solve the issue so okay. So yeah, I'm just gonna reload this again. And then so uh like okay, so so this was really soft when I click submit, I think. Oh wait, it's not. Maybe I rotate it wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
show this again. So, I can select. Uh, oh my, I think it might be something that I turn off again. Uh, okay. So, okay, yeah, so, oops, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so in this case, the answer was minus 3.14 divided by two. So, uh, yeah, so the uh, rotation axis is my unit Y sticking out of this truck, followed by uh, rotation angle of 3.14 divided by two, which is just 90 degrees uh, in their direction. So it will, yeah, it will rotate my truck back to normal. So once I submit this, and oh my god, why does it not look at me? Wait, what is this? I think you did not save the code. Oh, oops. Well, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, and yeah, and once I apply the quaternion uh, in that way, and my truck will be back to normal. So, uh, yeah, so afterwards, I I managed to get a better understanding of how the orientations were working and what they were using, which is uh, matrices and orientations. So uh, it depends on the different entities in, uh, provided. So there are some entities in CZMJS that actually still uses uh, matrices to represent it. Um, so it's good to be aware of both of these ways to keep track of orientation. So yeah, uh, and then uh, yeah, to, to, to do a quick um, round off of everything. So um, I think that when you're doing like web Java projects, like there, there are basically just a few things to take note of. Uh, like these are the, the most basic uh, things that you need to run through the rest of the project. So the first one is the navigation. So in terms of how the direction orientations uh, take, take place. So um, in CISM.js, like, because you, it's geospatial, so the center is the earth, right? So everything is centered around earth and there's like, you see the movements uh, can get very circular in a sense, like very spherical, like orbital in a sense. So uh, you have to think a lot of um, like, like where the wavefront is, which is usually the center of the earth, the very origin. And then like, uh, also need to get familiar with the concept of the camera which is basically the viewport of the canvas. And then like, uh, oh, and this is the reference system, which is the center of Earth. So once you've got the navigation down, the next is really just loading the objects that you want, like the 3D objects, or this is just drawing shapes that you want. You can even input like pictures or uh, videos. And then uh, this is the part that I thought was the coolest. So uh, you, can, you, can, you can actually inject like 3D models that you find online. Uh, you can also build your very own ones uh, using this technology called uh, photogrammetry. So what photogrammetry is, is basically uh, you just take um, sufficient pictures around a certain area. And then uh, uh, like these pictures will be taken at, from a certain angle to ensure that you can capture enough um, information about some of the, about the contrast like, in terms of the lines. So that, and then like when you pieces and, and then you have, um, Photogrammetry software like Pix4D, for example, that can help to um, basically link up all these pictures to form a 3D model. Then you can see that this uh, this bottom, this was actually a residential area uh, that uh, the company that I was interning in actually flew a drone across it to collect enough pictures around this entire area. And then we built up uh, a 3D model based on the entire area itself. So like this was uh, basically like a residential space. And depending on how many pictures you take, you can actually have very, very um, high quality uh, models. So like that was once like, um, like they actually managed to catch somebody inside, like, 
like 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 you actually see somebody from from the window inside, uh, like the windows inside the residential areas. Yeah. So um, it's actually like the the technology is actually pretty reliable. It's just very costly. Uh, yeah, and then uh, like you can then from there on, like you can actually like the rest is up to your imagination. I feel like you can build. Uh, many different kinds that uh, like many many different projects so some of the coolest ones that i've seen um, is how you could how you could basically draw on the earth so this can help you to to basically uh, mark out certain areas on the earth uh, you could even do measurements to find out like what what is this area on earth etc and then uh, there's so this one that i thought was really cool so this is actually a 3D model of um, Mount Everest. And then um, there's an area that's marked out. And then you can see that uh, there are numbers at individual points, right? So these numbers actually represents the height of uh, the, very, the, the very point that this was on top of. So if you're aware of, if, if you've heard of LIDAR, uh, this is actually um, similar to what LIDAR uh, works on. So LIDAR basically dots out different different point along the surface and then records like the distance itself to find like uh, like the certain uh, like the depth or the volume of certain area so yeah this is some yeah so uh, yeah so this was some of the the cooler projects that I uh, managed to um, get involved in when I was doing the internship so yeah I, I, I hope that this sharing gave everyone like uh, some sort of exposure or understanding of um, continents and matrix. And then I think once you've gotten that, uh, the rest the rest on the WebGL libraries are pretty intuitive and you should be able to do like anything you are interested in or anything you want, just explore on there. Okay. Thank you. This is cool. Thanks for the thanks for the sharing. Uh, we're doing perfectly on time, uh, but we have questions. Let's try to clear some of them. Uh, we have a few questions about gimbal locks. Uh, the first one being, is there a way to escape gimbal locks? Say, if I apply the inverse of the last rotation, is there a way to escape it? Oh, um, actually, actually, that actually there is a way to apply to to escape it. As in, um. It's like it isn't actually it isn't a physical lock in a sense. Uh, actually, it's more mathematical in a sense. Like um, when you approach gimbal lock, like uh, the values will actually will some like the values will disappear. So you cannot go back to the previous state. Um, in a sense, but um, I understand what you are trying to say. Um, I am not sure whether that is directly applicable, but I know some of the ways that they used to escape gimbal lock is. Like as the because because remember like the values reach ninety that's when gimbal lock happens right so usually like there are two methods they will do about it so the first one is before the values reach ninety so let's say eighty nine point five they will jump back like they will jump back or they will never reach ninety things like that or the other way is whenever it reaches eighty nine point five uh, any subsequent increase they will jump to ninety one so um, yeah you will never like they 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 will try to never reach because gimbal lock only happens at very fixed points so like only at angle goes to 90. So as long as you miss, as long as you jump across that point, then um, usually you will be, uh, you can escape some form of gimbal lock. Yeah. Mm, I see. Okay, I guess, uh, right. I think the other questions. My Siri just responded to my talking. Anyway, uh, let, let's look at, let's look into one other question. Uh, from Kenzie, uh, he asked, since in this system, the truck is in, in reference to the Earth, is there some kind of correction we need to make? Uh, you're muted, by the way. Please. Oh, okay. Uh, um, okay, so actually, there's, uh, there, there is some deviation, but uh, so I, I remember when I was doing it, there was two main kind of deviation that uh, we had to face. So the first one is because we know that we know that the Earth is not perfectly uh, like like it doesn't spin like like that, right? Like it spins like that. So the Earth spins at an angle. So uh, 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 like you have to take note of like so like so when so like X Y Z is like that. 
like the z of the axis is like that but the earth spins like that mm -hmm. so we have taken a lot of this deviation um so which is why it's safe it's actually which is why it's, which is, which is why it's safer to use uh longitude um, and latitudes and altitudes when you're doing anything that is with reference to the earth uh, mm -hmm. and then the second one was that uh, because we, we found out that um, there were some changes in the, in the altitude, but it was because it was because <clears throat> it was because if you look, is my screen being shared? Uh, no, you need to share your screen again. Oh, okay, no, 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 then don't need. Um, so because we know that the Earth has a like the sphere of the Earth, right, is always being uh, remodeled like every year. So <clears throat> so the so the exact dimensions of the sphere actually. It's updated every year actually. So um, sometimes if we use the old sphere uh, uh, to for calculations, which is automatic, which is automated in the season, but then you can always set like you want to use like which version of the sphere represents the earth. So uh, when you when you don't use the latest one, there can be deviations also. So for example, you can find that sometimes like um, maybe like the version of the sphere in 2018 uh, has like the highest point of Singapore as say. 290 meters, but then the version of the Earth in maybe 2000, in year 2000, has um has the highest point of Singapore as 100 meters. So like you have the kind of deviations as well. Mm. Wow, I see. So they have no us. Yeah, that one. Uh, that that one was new to me. Okay. Uh, it's seven already. So I think let's wrap up here. If you have any further questions, uh, you know where to find Chris. So uh, thanks, Chris, again for this sharing. Um, and regarding RK, uh, our next uh, next week we'll have an internal sharing because the content is quite sense uh, sensitive. Um, but it's an important one, so please come join us if we work at Shopee. And our next public event will be in two weeks. So that is all for today. Have a next. Nice, have a nice. Friday night, have a nice long weekend and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm.